<laughs> we are going to go ahead and get started with our next session, which is being led by Charles Dietline, also of NTIA. All right. Greetings, everyone. I'm uh, Charles Dietline. I'm from the Theory Division at NTIA ITS. I'd like to welcome you to this session on spectrum sharing field experiments. Um, this session is going to be a little different than the last panel session. We're going to have each of the speakers give some talks first, and then we'll go into panel mode. So, can you hear me? Uh, we can, but we can't see everything. No, do you have slides for no slides for the first one. Yeah, for me. So, first up is Colonel Stephen Trueblood, who's currently serving as the military deputy director. DOD CIO, Electromagnetic Spectrum Enterprise Policy and Programs, or MSEP. He is a distinguished graduate from the United States Air Force Weapons School, and this is his second assignment under the DOD CIO. He previously served as a senior mil military analyst to the Director of Spectrum Policy and Programs, the Office of the Secretary of Defense, where he helped develop and implement DOD strategic plans and policies. I've got another two pages, but I'm gonna cut it off right there and turn it over to Colonel Trueblood. Yeah, you can stand up here. I, I need a lot more notes, so thank you guys for bearing with me here. I appreciate it. Um, and I've also had a cold, so I apologize if my voice cracks. I'm not that young, I promise. Um, but good afternoon. My name's Colonel Stephen Trueblood, and I work for the Spectrum Office. Thank you for the introduction. I appreciate it. And, and thanks for the NSF and, and, and everybody for being here today. Um, <clears throat> I thank you. Again, I look forward to, I, I know I've gathered from sitting in the last panel, I gathered quite a bit of insight. Um, and uh, similar to Mrs. Bonner, I'm, I'm, I'm not an engineer. Um, my undergrad's in education. Um, my wife, I, she actually laughed at me when I said, yeah, there's a panel and, and I'm gonna be on it. And she's like, well, what kind of panel? And I said, it's something called nerds. And she's like, she starts laughing because every time we're at home and we, I start talking about spectrum, she goes to sleep. So. Um, so she thought it was hilarious. Uh, I appreciate being in this room and, and, and learning from you uh, on a daily basis for a lot of folks uh, that, that I've gleaned knowledge from, so I appreciate that. Uh, Dr. Chapin, thank you for uh, inviting me for this. And, uh, but no, honestly, uh, I appreciate it, and, and I really do look forward to working with uh, everyone. Um, this speech I'm gonna give kinda is tied more I'd say it ties into industry and ties into academia, but it, ultimately it's all about us all working together um, as, as a nation and all working together towards, towards that effort. Um, as, as what was mentioned earlier, it, it is a very, uh, it's gonna be an arduous 12 to 18 month sprint. Um, and, I, and I really do look forward to the partnerships that we are going to gain out of this. Um, the importance of dynamic spectrum sh sharing to DOD is no secret. Um, we've, we've said multiple times, you've heard many of our senior leaders uh, at, at DOD that, that we're gonna lean in on this effort. And, and we have been, um, we're, we're looking forward to, to leaning in even further. Hopefully I don't get sicker after that. Um, but just last month, Honorable Sherman, um, during the, uh, basically it said that Spectrum is important in our most sensitive and important federal missions and it's foundational in that nation's economic prosperity. And, and we truly believe that and we are supportive of that. Previously before Congress, Honorable Sherman has said you know, spectrum sharing must be our watchword. And, and we understand the importance of, of spectrum to all Americans. And we need spectrum for economic growth, scientific advancement, technological, technological leadership, our agriculture, medical care, safety, transportation. I could keep going on and on and on of what we need spectrum for. But ultimately, DOD supports all of these spectrum needs and, and wants to continue to find a way to share or coexist to fulfill this ever increasing demands while also ensuring that DOD can continue to do our missions at home and abroad. Today, I, I hope to share with you uh, the underpinnings of why dynamic spectrum sharing is important to DOD, um, some of the background on how we got here and, and, and how DOD is actually doing that leaning in as we've talked about before. <laughs> why is DOD, why is DSS, dynamic spectrum sharing, why is it so important to DOD? And, and, and as you've all seen in some legislation and policy documents, we, we often see the references to spectrum users. Um, these so-called users to, to us really, you know, they're people. Um, the people that need access to spectrum. And science specific DO, to DOD, this is something that leadership has taken to heart and continues to do so. 
uh, perhaps seemingly remote maybe to some in this room, but, but we have men and women in uniform overseas operating on our country's behalf at the ver this very moment, and, and all of them are operating within the spectrum, and it's critically important to the operations that they're conducting. The U.S. military and our partners and allies depend on assured spectrum access to do their job, um, whether that's in the Middle East, in Ukraine, in the Indo-Pacific, and even to defend our homeland. Um, frankly, we need to operate in the spectrum everywhere. And uh, allowing us, uh, developing a dynamic spectrum sharing framework that allows us to do that is, is really important and, and we're really looking forward to the opportunity. Without the assured spectrum access, DOD is at a tremendous uh, disadvantage. Um, our competitors know this and, and frankly they've invested uh, over the course of decades in spectrum concepts and capabilities designed to undermine our, our, uh, our U.S. advantage in the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, it was mentioned earlier how, how our adversaries are kind of aligning and trying to look at those areas where we normally operate and trying to deny us the ability to do so, that congested and, comp uh, congested and contested electromagnetic spectrum that we're concerned about. At the same time, DOD and perhaps everyone here recognizes that spectrum is also a strategic asset for industry. Um, we understand that there are uh, huge advantages of having um, more access to spectrum. We must balance national economic and national security imperatives as we drive towards solutions and one not be sacrificed or not need to be sacrificed for the other. These risks that we face are real. Um, the United States could lose both economically and militarily if we don't solve the spectrum challenges facing us today, right now, and assure access and maneuver within the spectrum. How did we get here? Um, many of you are aware of DOD's efforts to share in the lower three gigahertz band previously. Um, numerous military capabilities rely on spectrum in the 3.1 to 3.45 gigahertz band. Um, their importance at, at, for homeland defense and, and national security ca cannot be overstated. Uh, last September, DOD completed its emerging mid-band radar spectrum sharing feasibility assessment to the and provided it to the Secretary of Commerce pursuant to the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, IIJA. This, in this effort, the President and Congress placed trust and confidence in DOD to lead this spectrum study effort which examined the feasibility of sharing spectrum between federal and non-federal <coughs> users in the lower three gigahertz band. Our report culminated in a 20-month effort and reflects unprecedented collaboration between government, industry, and academia through the DOD-led partnering to advance trusted and holistic spectrum share solutions. I choke up on that every time I say it. PAS, as, as it's been known as. Um, it's past task group in partnership with the National, uh, National Spectrum Consortium uh, reflected a whole of nation approach. Perhaps several of you and your organizations participated in PAS previously, and we hope to continue to join, you continue to join us on these efforts, um, which I'll discuss in a moment. Also of note, in addition to establishing the unclassified group, we established a classified task group within PAS. That classified task group was at the secret level and included NTIA, FCC, and members of industry. The intent was to build trust and transparency and dispel any notion that DOD would hide behind classification. Embracing scientific and evidence-based analysis, the assessment found that spectrum sharing between federal and non-federal users in this band would be challenging, but doable if a capability for a large-scale dynamic spectrum sharing framework is developed at scale along with the rigorous testing, validation, and implementation of some other conditions. Just last month, DOD released a redacted version of this report, which is available on the DOD CIO website. I urge you to review the report to get a better sense of the rigor that went into this previ these previous efforts and the challenges that we are facing. Any sharing framework must ensure critical DOD and other federal capabilities are preserved in this band. However, solving these challenges would benefit the entire nation and not just DOD. These findings and ideas are now incorporated in the National Spectrum Strategy and we intend to build upon them as we move forward. How are we actually moving forward? How are we leaning in? Well, DOD is leaning in and remains commit committed to the spectrum sharing and coexistence for the benefit of the entire nation. In code leadership with NTIA and in collaboration with industry, academia, and others in government, Endeavors to, we endeavor to develop a dynamic spectrum sharing ecosystem 
which requires a moonshot approach. This effort is in alignment with the Ember study and tied to the other dynamic spectrum sharing efforts within the National Spectrum Strategy. The opportunity to evaluate the priority systems identified in the Ember's report can be facilitated through a diverse dynamic spectrum sharing ecosystem and already scheduled DOD exercises, which will include industry participation. A few quick points to underscore here. First, we have no bias towards any technology or technique. Uh, we are only interested in addressing the conditions in the Ember's report. The DSS tools DOD pursues will need to include cybersecurity, operational security, advanced automation, here's the buzzword, AI and ML uh, capabilities, spectrum situational awareness and responsiveness. We are interested in technologies and techniques that can actually fit this bill. Second, to dispel a common myth, DOD is not interested in controlling commercial terminals in any way, shape, or form. Related to this, and third, as we begin to establish a scalable and portable framework, it is equally important that we come to an agreement on a lexicon for dynamic spectrum sharing. Here's that definition that was talked about earlier, so if you want to write it down, that's fine. Um, and, and honestly, we'll get to that. DOD's definition of a dynamic spectrum sharing framework is adaptive coexistence within the electromagnetic spectrum enabled by evaluation and analysis of current prescribed and projected access among spectrum dependent systems. And this is the part I was talking about. We invite productive dialogue with other stakeholders on this definition within PATHS, the PATHS task group, as we are aware that many definitions are, do exist and are being discussed. As we embark on this la latest effort, we are reminded that the US, uh, that US industry and academia have helped defeat the greatest threats to freedom and democracy we've ever known. As one example in 1941, as Hitler's threat loomed ever larger, President Roosevelt realized he needed weaponry to fight the Nazis. Most importantly, he needed airplanes, and he needed them fast. I'm kind of biased, so I'm sorry. Uh, he turned to industry to help. Uh, industry answered the call, especially Henry Ford and his only son, Edsel. When FDR asked American industry to deliver 50,000 airplanes, Edsel then made the, what seemed like an outrageous claim. Ford Motor Company would create the largest airplane factory in the world, a factory that could yield a bomber an hour. People thought that was ridiculous. How could that ever be possible? As critics scoffed, Ford did not make planes. They don't make planes. They, they make simple, affordable cars. But bucking this criticism, Edsel charged ahead. The Fords would apply assembly line production to the America's military's largest, fastest, and most powerful bomber. They would build a plant vast in size and ambition and call it Willow Run. They would bring thousands of workers from across the country, transforming Detroit almost overnight from Motor City to the greatest arsenal of democracy. And eventually, they would help the Allies win the war. Industry and academia answered the call. The same spirit of ingenuity that fueled Ford's support to defeat the Nazis should inspire our work here. The time is now to scale our inspiration and our efforts to further spectrum sharing. Protecting our way of life and the nation are critical to ensuring economic prosperity and global technological leadership. And we cannot do this without the outstanding partnerships that we have forged through the consortium bodies like the National Spectrum Consortium and PATHS. Up front, this, this will be a sprint. As contemplated by the NSS, we are on a 12 to 18 month timeline to bring our ideas to reality. Within the department, we have our DOD level joint and service partners to support us with future exercises, test events, and experimentation. And we welcome our partners outside the department to join us as well. There is no substitute for testing and having access to systems within the most realistic operational environments. We understand that this access has been challenging in the past for many within academia and industry, but through our partnership with the National Spectrum Consortium, we endeavor to help build further trust and transparency and enable that ability to have access as needed. The focus of our efforts will include rigorously testing the conditions identified in the Ember study. These efforts will be focused on the development of a truly dynamic and scalable spectrum sharing capability. We also recognize that some technological solutions may be able to alleviate regulatory concerns while addressing the physical, physical hurdles of coexistence. Finally, we can remain attuned to the advances in spectrum technology through our partnerships as well. 
As the tech continues to develop, many of the challenges we face today may be solved by the tech developments of tomorrow. While some of the challenges surrounding the nine conditions previously identified within the Embers report appear very difficult now, uh, technological solutions may help resolve them, and we look forward to that opportunity. We understand spectrum is critical, uh, and it is a critical strategic asset, um, and we understand we must exercise responsible stewardship and find a way forward for all spectrum needs. We realize there is no quick silver, silver, bullet, silver bullets here. We also must recognize that the national spectrum, that national spectrum superiority cannot be achieved without perseverance, innovation, and collaboration across all stakeholders. We especially need to help from the help from industry and academia to continue to get through this. We want the United States to be successful economically, and we also want to work broadly to ensure we can keep this nation safe. Our women men, and men in the service, um, we want to keep them safe downrange as well, wherever they have to deploy now or in the future. And we look forward to the opportunity to use this a, as an ability to do so. This is a sacred obligation, and we all should share that same sacred obligation as well. We must do this, do what is necessary to assure spectrum access for all stakeholders. Spectrum sharing provides the most efficient use of spectrum for government and non-government spectrum users. History is watching and time is of the essence. We know this effort will be challenging. However, we are called to meet this moment with great ambition. And we are calling on our nation, industry, government, academia to join us in this moonshot. Some of you have may have attended the relaunch of PAS um, a, a few, few, actually last month um, at the national, with the National Spectrum Consortium, and I appreciate if you were in attendance there, and you probably have heard some of the similar things there. Um, but our next meeting is on May 22nd, and we're going to discuss next steps. I'm just glad to discuss um, some details with anyone after uh, we break here, and, and uh, you're either in the foyer or, or in the room if we have time. So I look forward to your feedback and collaboration, and thank you again for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Now we'll pivot from DOD to radio astronomy. Let me find the file here. So Chris Dupree is Deputy Spectrum Manager, National Radio Dynamic Zone Project Director and Radial Project Scientist for NRIO in Charlottesville, Virginia. A radio astronomer by training, he received his BS in physics from Duke University and PhD in physics from UNC Chapel Hill. He taught physics and astronomy at Agnes Scott College in Atlanta, Georgia for 25 years before joining NRIO in 2021. Chris. And I think you're right there. <laughs> Is it? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Great. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, thanks to you all for being here. Thank you for the invitation to be here from Chris and John. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Oh. While that's happening, uh, I'll just say uh, I've really enjoyed all the discussions here today. And as many astronomers, uh, uh, Dave DeBoer mentioned this to me a minute ago, I kind of feel like the Lorax. Uh, if you've all read the Lorax, I am the Lorax. I speak for the trees. <laughs> Access to views of the universe is what everyone needs, right? So uh, if any of you have read Dr. Seuss, you know, uh, the astronomy perspective on this is that uh, I think all astronomers understand the incredible usefulness uh, economically in terms of defense and all other uses, but there's also basic human knowledge, right? And, and I think one of the goals of radio astronomers in this enterprise is to make sure that radio astronomy and astronomy in general is possible from the surface of the Earth for students now, students in the coming decades. Because although we are able to put observatories in space, potentially, you know, decades in the future on the far side of the moon. We can't do that now, right? And uh, if any of you have seen the Green Bank Telescope in West Virginia, building that on the moon is gonna take us a long time. Uh, but we have those instruments now. And so what I wanna tell you about quickly today is uh, a pilot program in spectrum uh, awareness and coexistence and really dynamic spectrum sharing that's happening um, in the age of uh, satellite constellations. So. Uh, over the past few years, I've been working with a number of colleagues at NRAO, Bang Nan, uh, who's here, uh, Sheldon Wasik, Aaron Lawson, and Daniel Batista, and, and also with a couple of uh, policy folks and engineers at SpaceX. And uh, we've been engaged in a number of experiments, and I just want to tell you what we've been up to. Uh, 
Um, so since 2021, I arrived uh, in Charlottesville. Um, we've been engaged with a number of both coordinated and uncoordinated experiments with uh, SpaceX. Um, we started with uh, uh, a pilot experiment uh, out in the Alamo Navajo Reservation uh, out in New Mexico. Uh, we have been doing downlink testing at both the VLA and the Green Bank Telescope um, since 2021 and 2022. And if any of you were able to go to uh, Bang's uh, poster presentation on Monday, we've been engaged in what's called operational data sharing. I'll say a few words about that as well. Um, and most recently, we actually had a, a visit uh, a few months ago with Amazon Kuiper at Green Bank Telescope and with SpaceX engineers and policy folks out at the VLA. And I think one of the best ways to impress that Lorax feeling uh, on our colleagues in commerce industry is to show the incredible effort that goes into both building, maintaining, uh, and operating these uh, world-class radio telescopes that are located uh, in the US. So uh, our working relationship with SpaceX has been uh, excellent and they've actually been actively involved in the development of operational data sharing. Very briefly, it's a system where we sort of say in real time what our telescopes are doing and allow the space constellation networks to adapt to that operating environment. Um, and we've also recently performed uh, some very preliminary experiments with supplemental coverage from space. So uh, early on, uh, we did these experiments out in New Mexico. Um, we we uh, took a single user terminal that SpaceX sent to us, uh, and I met up with a SpaceX engineer and a couple of NRAO folks, James Robnett and a few others, and we drove around the desert and plunked the user terminal down, downlinked, and we had access to the VLA, so we were observing at the same time. And um, we found a couple of interesting things, one of which was uh, uplink signals were not really our problem, it was mostly the downlink signals. And actually, in those early tests where we were simply downlinking to a user terminal, we had very detailed information about exact channel usage uh, from a particular satellite and where satellites were in the sky. Um, we actually found, we, we detected some downlink signals, but without knowing exactly uh, where everything was in the sky as it was transmitting, only knowing which downlink channels were being used, we had a hard time pinpointing uh, where they were. So we actually adapted that experiment a little bit. Uh, and I will emphasize that this whole process of the last few years has sort of operated as our own little private uh, RDZ, right? So we've been engaged in this type of experimentation. We had access to a sensitive radio telescope. We could get maintenance time on the telescope. And we've been able to do these experiments uh, that have been very, very helpful. We did similar experience uh, uh, at the Green Bank Telescope, which is located in West Virginia. And um, some of these early results are explained in an EVLA memo, which is public EVLA memo 222. And so as a result of that first test, we actually asked SpaceX, go ahead and illuminate the site and illuminate it in one channel. And when that happened, of course, we saw it. So there's a single baseline, right? The VLA operates with pairs of antennas, our, our baselines. And on one of our shortest baselines that had a projected uh, uh, view of the sky that was in a particular direction, we saw a very strong uh, downlink signal in a particular channel at the time when we knew the satellite was traversing uh, fairly close to that baseline. We were also able to make predictions about the predicted signal strength. And in fact, our predictions were, were pretty close uh, to what we expected. We expected on a few of the very shortest baselines, which are the most sensitive to RFI in an interferometer, that we would see signals of uh, sort of Tanjanskis. We predicted a bunch, uh, that's the blue data points there, a bunch of gray data points sort of somewhere between where, where the RFI was present but didn't exceed the, the strength of our uh, calibrator source, uh, the gray points, and then the red points were sort of below our noise limit. So what we were interested in is um, over, over time, uh, how would those gray data points, right, which, are, which is RFI that we're detecting from downlink signals, how would that impact our uh, imaging capabilities? And so we, in, in conjunction with the Alamo Navajo Reservation, which is sort of to the northeast of the VLA, this is a location that was severely impacted by the pandemic in many ways. Uh, water shortages, lots of COVID inf uh, infections, and uh, very little access to wireless. And so we actually um, describe this in a memo as well that you can go look at if you're interested. But we basically decided to undertake long-term monitoring. And uh, in conjunction with SpaceX, we uh, we went ahead and installed for 60 families on the reservation user terminals uh, all across the reservation. It's a very uh, diffuse population, no real you know, population center, but family, families are located all over the re reservation. 
And we have been doing long-term monitoring since spring of 22. So we have two years of data and we've actually gone through two complete configuration cycles. And so uh, residents on the Alamo reservation uh, who signed up for this mostly were people who had young kids who needed this for access for education. Um, and we've actually gone through two complete configuration cycles. And this is the faint field source that we look at every time. Uh, those sources are one milligansky, which if you don't know, uh, Jansky is 10 to the minus 26 watts per square meter per hertz. So a millijansky is even less than that, right? Uh, so this is a faint source field. And actually, uh, most of the time, uh, we, we, uh, we are able to image this. And in fact, we end up with, in, in a typical image field, about nine microjanskys of RMS noise. So the background is nine microjanskys, and we have these faint sub millijansky sources superimposed on that. But the good news is, over the course of the past two years, the Alamo pilot uh, monitoring data shows that uh, we do have a, two outlier data points here, and I've talked to one of our data analysts about this. Um, the, the, the colors, the banded colors, are the configurations. So the VLA goes from the A configuration, which is its largest, to the D, which is its smallest. And you would expect that the RFI issues would be uh, most prevalent in the smallest configuration, where you have the most short baselines. And so you can see we started the experiments in the A configuration, it goes from A to D and then expands back out, C, B, A. And in fact, when we were out visiting recently, it was really impressive because the, you were able to see the telescope crews moving the telescopes. They actually have to get up underneath them, pick them up, move uh, down the track. And so with, with the exception of those two outlier data points, over time, the RMS noise in that image field that I just showed you has been relatively constant over time. So the good news is for an interferometer, the downlinks do not appear to be uh, a major issue. So our current issue with, uh, with uh, Starlink downlink testing is actually um, looking into something that we call uh, close to bore site passages. Um, because uh, the, the real challenge, it, it turns out, when we first started thinking about this problem, and again, this is the advantage of this iterative process of being able to do experiments and analyze the data and, and think about it, um, is that we sort of thought that the location of the downlink beam was gonna be the critical element and that we didn't want downlink beams within a certain radius. Well, you certainly don't want to have you know, your telescope and the satellite meeting one another, uh, pointing at one another. But, but in fact, what we found, and it was sort of a fortuitous discovery, is that more than where the, tele the satellite is pointing is uh, where it is with respect to our boresight, right? So when a satellite gets close to our boresight, that's the critical uh, thing that we want to try to avoid. And so this was a discovery that we made in actually a Green Bank telescope test where uh, we were doing uncoordinated tests. We were just pointing toward the northern horizon and we tipped the telescope down towards the horizon and then back up again. And when we were at 25 degrees from the horizon, we saw this huge signal, thousands of Janskys. And uh, we went ahead and went to the public uh, TLE data sites and you know, found out, uh, we said, well, we, we think you had a satellite very close to Boresight. Uh, and SpaceX said, no, 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 we were far off. We were a couple, you know, we were a degree away. And we said, no, we really think you were very close to Boresight. <laughs> Can you look at your data? They came back and they said, yes, we were. We were very close to Boresight and they confirmed what you see there on the left. That is the, the um, GBT um, beam pattern on the sky out to about uh, plus or minus one degree. And that's the satellite trajectory. And then over on the right is the, um, the, the relative power in the telescope as it passes through that beam pattern. And then the red line at the bottom is the sort of one second average version of that. So what happens here, each of those dots in the image on the left is one second of time, right? So when these satellites pass close to Boresight, it's a very short interaction, but it's a very critical one, right? That we have to sort of understand and try to account for and get rid of. So in this incredibly oversimplified diagram is the idea, right? Where Starlink satellites are, are serving cells on the earth. We all know they don't have a single beam per satellite, but that's another story. Um, <clears throat> and then, uh, they have agreed to avoid certain regions. For example, around the Green Bank Telescope, They're, they are avoiding that region. But the important thing that we've asked them to, and they've agreed to cooperate with, is that when we're looking at a particular point in the sky, their satellite network is able to take different actions as they pass close to Boresight. And so the iterative negotiation is how close to Boresight, how, you know, um, uh, what frequencies, right? And all these things we can sort of negotiate with them. And they have been great partners uh, in figuring that out. Bang gave a great poster. It's also online. It's linked in this talk uh, about the operational data sharing plan supported by NSF. 
and operational data sharing is uh, this, this very idea that we are gonna share what we are doing at what frequencies we're at for what amount of time uh, and what our bandwidth is and where we're pointing in the sky critically. SpaceX ingests that data and then adapts their network to that understanding. For example, simple case, uh, we're operating an L band. Their X band downlink doesn't matter, right? They don't have to be very careful because they're not gonna overwhelm our receiver. So we've done some early tests. We've confirmed that if we provide uh, data, they can read it, check. We've also confirmed that if they give us a pointing on the sky, they can actually uh, either do beam shifting, right? Change their beam shape or their beam direction or actually shut off their transmitter for a very brief period of time as they pass through Boresight and actually Bang's poster and an upcoming uh, letter that we're about to submit uh, explains that process. And so just to give an example, um, these were also on Bang's poster. On the left is the test that we did at the Green Bank Telescope in October, uh, showing uh, bore site avoid avoidance uh, not engaged. And you can see the different colors are sort of one second integration. So you can kind of see the satellite pass through bore site, the signal gets stronger and fades out. And the green lines of uh, vertical are the sort of channel separations, right? So they have eight downlink channels that have, they have accessible. On the right is in February, the same exact experiment with boresight avoidance engaged, and we can see that basically we see a flat spectrum. We don't see, even though those satellites are traversing just as close to boresight, we don't see them. How much time do I have? Oh, two minutes, okay. Uh, very quickly, other spectrum efforts. We're uh, working hard to build an RFI GUI um, for multiple data sets. So we actually have an RFI GUI that's available for GBT data. Um, but we're trying to incorporate now VLA, VLBA, and in fact, the CHIME outrigger located at the Green Bank Telescope. Um, we are in discussions with other satellite constellations to do similar work, and um, I'm glad to hear all the discussions of uh, the need to monitor spectrum because we are hard at work building uh, ASM2. We, we tested ASM1 actually a, a year ago. In it, we have implemented a bunch of uh, things that we learned from our spectrum monitor and we're in the process of building out uh, ASM2 now that'll cover from one to 50 gigahertz with, the, uh, with direction finding uh, capabilities. And in the lower right there is uh, the engineering drawing of our one to 20 gigahertz sinuous antenna that we're in the process of actually putting together right now. Okay, so challenges, um, you know, we've been talking about this all week. There is satellite transmission at all remote sites. Um, and you know, this is the problem. The assumptions that uh, have been prevalent since the beginning of radio astronomy that if you put a radio telescope at a remote site and don't point close to the horizon, you can avoid most RFI. That's not the case anymore, right? That model is changing. Um, and so we have to change, right? There's, a, there's an incredibly rapid pace of change. Uh, the problem is radio telescopes take decades to build, right? And so radio telescopes are large, they're expensive. Uh, and so we have to think of creative ways to adapt. And I, I think NRAO is working hard with partners across the country, uh, both other observatories and also uh, with uh, SpaceX and hopefully other constellation companies to figure this problem out because this is not gonna go away. Um, and I'll end with just saying that, you know, we, we do have a really good collaborative experimental relationship with uh, SpaceX. Several of their engineers are co-authors on the paper we're about to submit. And, um, you know, Open communication between uh, you know, passive users and active users of the, of the spectrum is incredibly important. Um, when we have made discoveries about issues that were coming up, they have been very responsive. And you know, there were issues where we saw these narrow band signals between channel pairs and they had some LO issue on board that they were able to solve. Um, so when, when you're in this kind of weekly, bi-weekly communication, they can act on things. You know, if there's a software fix, they'll do it, right? And so that's been a, a great part uh, about this. And some of the issues that we exposed with our very sensitive receivers, they weren't aware of, right? And so that's, it's a two-way relationship. Um, and by the way, that picture on the right uh, is two weeks ago when we met them, we actually had an antenna climb out at the VLA. So uh, we've engaged in this uh, testing and data sharing with SpaceX. Um, we're interested in extending this type of relationship with other satellite constellation uh, operators. Um, and I think at NRAO, we strongly feel that there are engineering solutions to these problems, right? There is a way forward. There are engineering solutions. Um, there are some of these uh, issues like supplemental coverage from space 
that are going to be very challenging. I don't know that anyone sees an easy solution to that problem yet because of the nature of those systems, but I think uh, we're excited to be engaged in the effort. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you very much, Chris. That was some very good examples of field experiments. Um, now we're going to pivot to the uh, phase one EL leads. So uh, first up, Dr. Alafia Hussein is the PI for the Aspire project, one of the phase one leads for engineering and execution within the National Radio Dynamic Zone program. She is a principal scientist and research team leader at USC's Information Science Institute. She's also the deputy director of USC's Center for Research in Space Technologies and has 20 plus years of experience in network experimentation and test beds. full screen. Is there a way to make this full screen or? Control E. L. L. There we go. Okay. So um, I'm, I'm Alifia Hussein. I'm uh, the uh, one of the engineering and execution leads. Uh, Curtis here is uh, the other team. Um, my team is consists of the Idaho National Labs, along with University of Utah, Robert uh, Ritchie, and Arup uh, Bhuyan there, uh, who's also present here in the room. So today we're actually gonna talk about really advanced networks. Advanced networks really form the digital infrastructure over which we have military advancements as well as economic advancements over the years. Uh, just as we've seen sort of the internet spur this, it's sort of an exciting time to see uh, dynamic spectrum sharing, pushing this forward. Um, part of the uh, part of the nerds' effort is really actually looking at how we can create an environment for innovation, and and do dynamic sharing experiments that give us a better insight uh, into making this happen and build trust within the environment. So what we are really doing is actually uh, attacking this problem along three axes. Really, we're trying to figure out how we can leverage deep expertise within the dynamic spe uh, sh sharing spectrum ecosystem, uh, not only within the NSF, but all the other uh, efforts that are going on that we've heard throughout this week uh, to accelerate practical dynamic spectrum sharing through, through uh, exemplars, through examples. And in that process, build a set of open set open source tools that can be leveraged and specialized and customized so we can come to this longer vision of building a national radio dynamic zone uh, because um, sharing is different in different locations and has different constraints. And through this process, can we build data sets, 
and tools and mechanisms that help us as a community build trust and really push this forward. So really, um, you know, just as we had sort of the open skies effort that pushed radio astronomy forward in 1950s, this is another opportunity through NSF looking at the National Radio Dynamic Zone. Can we do open air experimentation through radio dynamic zones uh, within this effort? As part of really the engineering and execution lead over the last couple of months, we've actually looked at two use cases specifically to, to help spur some of this uh, 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 experimentation work. We're looking at two cases. One is dynamic protection, which is in line with what Chris spoke. How do we protect radio astronomy? Because fundamentally, while Chris is in a very amazing national radio quiet zone, there are very few national radio quiet zones. And the possibility of having, <laughs> uh, having national radio quiet zones, I have my radio astronomers uh, saying there are very few, <laughs> only one. Uh, but the possibility of having more national radio quiet zones or any quiet zones is highly unlikely. So in fact, one of the pressing needs for radio astronomy is to make dynamic spectrum sharing work in order for radio astronomy to survive. So you have, that is the dynamic protection uh, example that we're gonna look at. And then the other example is dynamic transmission. That's something that we use all the time when we use our cell phones, when we use any other uh, device wirelessly, how do we effectively use the spectrum and balance the needs of various stakeholders, including several people on the panel. And through this process, really derive a set of tools that help us not only manage these radio dynamic zones that could be present in different environments, but also uh, develop tools for experimentation. So what does it mean to do an experiment for, for dynamic spectrum sharing? I know there are different agencies coming at this uh, at, different, you know, uh, at different levels. The way we are thinking about it is really you need to have the whole life cycle that you need to manage, all the way from planning, what are the tools you, you, you need for uh, environmental feasibility, spectrum allocation feasibility, uh, engaging with regulation, to designing what it means to deploy in that environment, uh, where, you know, how do you ensure uh, that you have the right amount of data to be able to make the conclusions you want uh, to go ahead and sort of deploy that, run it for enough time, and then analyze that data. And through that process of that field trial, again, both for dynamic protection and sharing, you, you continuously derive a set of tools that you harden that then can be specialized and customized for different various uh, dynamic zones. So, when we are actually approaching this, uh, and this is work that hopefully will be conducted um, over the next several years, we actually have three levels of uh, goals. In the near term, this is in line with the DSS that recently came out. In the first 16 months, our goal is really to race to conduct field trials. And we are trying to create field trials in, in two uh, scenarios. One is sort of, passive protection, uh, uh, doing this at Hat Creek Radio Observatory, ACRO, uh, which has a telescope, the ATA, the Allen Telescope Array, uh, and we are trying to do sharing with a terrestrial system, a third party terrestrial system at that location. Uh, again, over those 16 months, we'll also explore uh, a, a protection mechanism uh, at, uh, at at uh, the powder facility where we're gonna share with CBRS. Uh, and so can we provide mechanisms where we can, in the testbed environment, do an effective CBR, CBRS sharing with known cooperative GAAs uh, at that location. And along with it, keep building and, and, and enhancing our toolkit that we develop. So that's sort of the near term goal within the first 16 months. Based on our successes in those first 16 months, we will take those tools and then sort of ex expand the scope and scale of those experiments and run those experiments for a longer time so we can see what it means to run for a period of four months or longer. Our goal is to be able to run these uh, uh, as capstone field trials that run for a long duration. 
and at the same time harden the sets of tools that we have developed. And at that time, the DSS will have had made progress and had, uh, will provide input too. And really the long-term vision, a decadal vision as I would, as John also outlined, would be to figure out what it would mean to generalize and customize these RDCs because all these environments are very, very different. So I'll go into some of these things. So, you know, it's exciting right now. We've heard, we've spent the last four days hearing a lot of, uh, a lot about spectrum. There's a lot of synergies and this effort will, 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 will synergize with efforts going on not only at NTIA, specifically 3.2G with the national DSS testbed as we, as we heard earlier, but also there has been past work. We are actually standing on the so shoulder of giants. Works have, work has started, I think, in early 2020s where the conceptualization of the NRDZ had started. And so our goal is to really continue engaging with the various stakeholders in the industry across academia, government, and, in the, and um, and, and, and industry to, to engage and see how the vision of the NRDZ will evolve and, and what are the pieces required in order to make it happen. So I'll take a few minutes and just quickly go over what we have planned. As one knows, experimentation in dynamic spectrum sharing uh, has a number of stakeholders and you need to get alignment among various parties. Our goal with this experiment really with Radio Observatory unlike what Chris described, is actually to share with a third party terrestrial stakeholder. What Chris described was somebody out in the sky, but radio astronomy has to con be conducted on Earth, and on Earth you also have people polluting this, uh, uh, the, uh, the spectrum. So this is uh, Hat Creek, which is in Redding, California, and uh, at that site in around uh, early 2020, there were a lot of smart meters deployed. And soon after, I think Alex Pollock noticed that there was a lot of RFI that was generated at the telescope. Uh, so we have some initial measurements here, and they actually, re we redid some of these measurements uh, in early April, and this is a plot from, from then, where we're actually seeing repeated RFI within the 900 ISM band uh, that, that you see there. So our goal really here is to work with pg e who, who controls these smart meters and, and get them to actuate their meters to, to create some silence. And, and that's one path. And then the other, or the other path is also sort of do scheduling for the telescope in order to ensure that we don't observe during the time when their when they're, um, smart meters are transmitting at high power. So, so uh, our goal will be to have some real-time closed loop coordination that allows us to manage the RFI at the site so we can use the ATA more effectively. The other experiment uh, we're gonna look at uh, is uh, dynamic transmission. Here where we are, uh, this is at the powder test bed that several of you are already familiar with. Uh, the, the powder test bed at Salt Lake City, Utah has, uh, um, has several GAA users who they know and they collaborate with, uh, who, are, who, who are cooperative, I should say, and there, there is also a PAL user that they are aware of within the system. So our goal here is through collaboration uh, with these known cooperative GAA users, can we do more effective allocation of the spectrum bands uh, through closed loop coordination that is of time scales that are shorter than what we typically see through, uh, through existing mechanisms? And so can we improve our spectral intelligence mechanisms as well as our spectrum coordination mechanisms uh, using this interaction to, do, to make more uh, bandwidth and spectrum bandwidth available for experimentation within the powder uh, test bed. And through both of these, both in the near term, which is the 16 months, as well as the, the, the midterm, which, uh, which is four years, we want to continue enhancing the NRDZ toolkit. And so not only do we develop, you know, taking the OpenZMS framework that has been uh, developed as part of the phase one efforts uh, within within an RDZ uh, efforts, can we expand that to add tools both for engineering, regulation, uh, regulation and planning, 
uh, and execution and analysis that help us really run these experiments more effectively, not only at these two locations, but also scale and generalize to other RDCs in the future. And so that is, um, uh, that is sort of the NRDC toolkit can be, de can be develop these aspects uh, rigorously. Uh, one of the biggest things and uh, challenges in doing any DSS experimentation is spectrum access and regulation support. Uh, our goal really uh, uh, in the long run would be to provide mechanisms that, that streamline this process. I think streamlining this process is the first step towards automating it. So can we figure out how we can streamline this process so we can actually uh, be able to translate our learnings to multiple RDZs? And hopefully in the long run, uh, have an ability for NRDZs to do some delegation authority themselves, and those are some models that we will explore uh, over the four, uh, course of four years. Um, so that's really what we hope to do in, in the next four years, that is leverage existing solutions within the NRDZ community to create practical exemplars of dynamic spectrum sharing, not only for protection, but also active transmission and build sets of tools uh, that can be widely applied across multiple RDCs. Thank you. Thank you for that very interesting overview. Um, next up is Dr. Curtis Watson. He's a principal communications engineer in MITRE Labs communications, SIGINT, and PNT department. His interest is in the combination of both traditional signal processing and data-driven approaches applied to discovery characterization and synthesis of signals within the RF spectrum. Since joining MITRE, Curtis has contributed to and led several efforts with the task to understand unknown communication signals. This work has supported a wide sponsor base within the DOD. And currently, Curtis serves as the PI for the MITRE NERDS Phase One Engineering and Execution Lead. Curtis. Well, thank you. Uh, Curtis Watson, Meyer Corporation. This will be a very similar discussion uh, to what Alethea just presented because we are both uh, tasked to propose uh, you know, this phase two uh, effort for the EEL. Um, for those, quickly, for those that don't know Meyer Corporation, we manage uh, several federally funded research and development centers, system engineering, um, and, you know, as I heard earlier, there's a NTIA NOFO meeting at McLean uh, tomorrow morning. I'm actually located in the Bedford campus up in Boston area. And as you can see on the slide here, for the second phase, we partnered with Northeastern as part of our corporate strategic uh, partnerships with them to integrate together and, and propose Sparky Eel as our team name. Um, I got to get better at prompt engineering because when I tried to generate a logo, it was a very angry looking snake. So <laughs> not, uh, not really. But the concept that we, we started to develop in the first phase was what we called nerds as a service. And we want to push that forward going into uh, phase two. Uh, again, you know, very similar to what Alifia uh, mentioned, you know, part of the ask and I apologize, all I've been thinking about is this proposal, so we're gonna, you're gonna get some high level views on what we put into our proposal here. Um, like, uh, like was mentioned, there, there was two goals to do some experimentation with a RA and um, terrestrial uh, systems and then also a spectrum research facility. Um, you know, the one of the things that we wanted to lean into was, you know, developing the, you know, the engineering capabilities to have these successful uh, experiments. And you know, from our perspective, that, that means independent assessment and trustworthy experimentation. And so as part of this toolkit that we'd want to develop, um, you know, there's, a very, there's, there's a number of functions, obviously it'll grow over time, but you know, kind of identifying upfront the three that we think are the most important to get going at the beginning. Um, first is incumbent protection. Um, you know, as we've heard all day, uh, interference is, is the challenge, uh, especially with the RA facilities. Um, and so, you know, that, that, that requires us to establish this RDZ monitoring network, you know, capabilities to 
provide a safety net uh, around not only uh, you know the RA if that's the particular um, experiment, but the non-participant incumbents that that don't even, may not may not even know that we're doing the experiment. And so you know showing you know we've seen some of the volume pictures uh, throughout the day. You know one of the things that we've been pushing forward is that there's actually two of these boundaries that, that must exist. There's the experimental RD zone, RD zone where all the experimental participants are. Um, but then we really need to have this outer one that maybe the incumbents outside of the experiment uh, is aware of. And, and really that gap is that integrity boundary that really it's a measure of our uncertainty about what's going to happen. And so that's, that's going to be the primary function of that RDZ monitoring network is to uh, just maintain that because it's, it's experimental. I mean, in fact, as an engineer, I'm hoping that we do break things and things will happen, but we still need to have that safety net. Um, so that's one of the key functions. The second one is optimization. And, you know, again, that's a, that's a tricky term because that can mean many things, uh, but we'll just go with it. And, and in this context, at least to start, we're talking about tools that allow us to do pre-exercise planning, um, you know, maybe optimization or uh, try to determine near optimal sensor laydown of where we might want to put these monitors, um, interference protection or prediction, um, tabletop exercises could be another type of uh, tool that could fit this category. Um, but it, it, what we're proposing here is to, you know, working with the Northeastern team with, you know, the Coliseum massive channel emulator that they're uh, that they have, you know, can we use that to help us with this initial pre-exercise of scenarios that might help us as we develop the other tools uh, that predict the, the, what's going to happen in the experiment. It might fold into the SOPP that, you know, Kevin's team is building out there at Hat Creek. Um, so th things of that nature is, is another function that we think really needs to be a part of this toolkit. Uh, and then I think the probably one of the more important features is portability. You know, all these tools need to, you know, we need some future researcher that we don't even know right now might be interested in using these tools. And so having the ability to take anything to, you know, develop in one location, have it, have some assurance and confidence that's gonna work in another location is another key function. Um, I think we all recognize a zone management system is required in the spectrum uh, sharing uh, scenarios that we're talking about. Uh, you know, Cobus's team with OpenZMS has been maturing their capability. I know there's a spectrum consumption models. There's plenty of teams that are looking at these solutions. And so one of the things that we want to put forth is, is the ability to, you know, independently assess, maybe even certify air quotes, the ZMS solutions so that, again, you have that confidence that, you know, if you take this de de developed solution here, take it to another location, it's going to work. Um, you know, again, just one of the things, you know, my other other half of my time, I support uh, an IRPA program, Scissors. There's been a few, Dinesh and Kashik, and I see Arup in the back have supported this. One of the things that uh, I learned being part of the, the government T&E team was, you know, everyone, all the teams, all the performers in that program developed their capabilities in-house at their location, works great. But then when they brought it to the physical test bed that we had for the IRPA program, there was always just issues. I mean, it's just natural integration issues. You, you bring something new. It wasn't, maybe you didn't, maybe the APIs weren't exactly aligned or, you know, you weren't expecting the background to look like it was. So again, it just, it, that's part of the justification or the part of the, my thought or reason for my thought process on this portability function, test functions, the verify functionality. Um, so again, in that, in that kind of spirit of the functions of the, the, the tools, um, we really wanted to lean in our initial engineering on the, the Hack Creek example. Um, obviously, we got two over the course, if, we, if we're selected for phase two, we got four years to complete both of them. But you know, the, the nice thing about Hack Creek is, well, it's, it's an RA, so it's by, on purpose in a somewhat benign scenario. You can go out there and be somewhat confident that you're not going to mess with other people. Um, there's also just the ability for us to, you know, again, take, take a ZMS that might be developed at another location, bring it to a, a different location, test out the functionality, verify that we've created a portable function. And then also, you know, just given some of the locations that we've been considering, you know, the ease of the physical access at a location might make it a little easier for us to install s sensors or, or integrate into their sensors. So, you know, from an engineering uh, focus, you know, starting there, we can, probably kick out, uh, work out a lot of the kinks or all the bugs in our processes, and then now we can hit the ground running on the spectrum research uh, 
aspect, the goal B in the program. The other thing about that is we want to we want to lean into this timeline. I mean, as we've heard all day, uh, spectrum strategy, uh, the moonshot, you know, timeline. You know, the next 18 to 24 months is critical. I mean, actually, it's probably even shorter than that. But for you know the vision that John has for the NSF, this NSF Nerds program, you know, this first 18 to 24 months is critical. And so we want to lean into the engineering, get the experimentation up and running. So now that we can start to demonstrate uh, this capability, uh, you know, just in my experience, that tends to lead to once you can start showing things to people, people get more interested, you find other opportunities, other exercises, other experiments that you can participate in. And so again, that's why you know, we, we identified the, you know, the, the monitoring network, the ZMS verification scenario emulation is, is some of the initial engineering work. But all along, you know, as, as Alifia pointed out, you know, we have the smart meter issue out of Hack Creek, you know, that third party engagement. I mean, we don't even know if PNG wants to play ball with us, uh, and, and so you know, just understanding what might make up that that uh, uh, third party to satisfy some of the constraints of our requirements is going to be very critical in that, those first first few months. And being able to show that we can do things that operates uh, simultaneously with their their operations, I think that's going to be key to our uh, ability to convince them to be a participant. Um, and again, you know, kind of showing how all these things dovetail. I mean, obviously, there's other study team efforts going on in NERDS. Um, you know, again, this will create the opportunity for those, those efforts to try to fold into this future work that we're planning to work on. Um, it also leads opportunities for our, the EEL uh, with this community to lead some discussion, you know, again, with the larger community uh, defining metrics of success, what's the right, you know, data management procedures or constructs. Um, whether we're talking AIML or even just uh, privacy concerns related to data collection. And then, again, just opportunities to, to identify collaboration. So this is kind of my get off the, slide, or get off the stage slide. Um, you know, basically, you know, the vision, you know, leading towards the overall vision. I mean, at some day we want to have the nerd somewhere. I think a lot of talk over the last 18 months is, you know, focused around you know, New Mexico is a nice exemplar because you got a lot of things there. You have the very large array, you got some military installations, you got, um, you know, Playas, you got a, a, a city in Albuquerque. You know, it, it's a good location. And again, there's probably other locations that equally well, but that one could be the hub of uh, maybe a future uh, installation. But really what we want to get to is this federation of RDZ locations um, that are, you know, connected in a manner so that you actually could do remote experimentation across the country, um, participating with multi-stakeholders, multi-researchers. Uh, um, and really, you know, we want to, you know, again, try to progress up that maturation ladder. Um, you know, DOD speak, uh, the, the TRL scale, you know, we really want to get to the higher TL TRLs or the more mature capabilities, go from, you know, large scale emulation, to doing in situ experiments, but then at the end of the day, we want to have something that's very ro robust, reliable, and stable, so that then ultimately industry and government can take take uh, hold of it. Um, and so with that, that was my last slide, and we can get to the panel. Very good, no more slides. Okay, we've got 20 minutes till the coffee break, and we have a few questions we're gonna go through here. We're not gonna go just down the line. I'm kinda gonna maybe direct uh, someone to lead off the answers to each of these questions, and then hopefully there can be some productive back and forth here. So you guys have the questions. Let's start with number four. So then the National Spectrum Strategy emphasizes the need to work with industry and academia. How might this best be accomplished in this effort and elsewhere to enable spectrum sharing and coexistence? And uh, let's start with Curtis. Yeah, um, well, actually, we heard Grill say a little bit earlier about whole of nation problems, and that, that's something that MITRE actually likes to say is that we try to solve whole of nation problems, try to be a connector um, in the sense of being that connective tissue between whether it's academic, industry, and then the federal govern government. And you know, I definitely see that that's, that's what's needed here um, because we do need uh, the opportunities to have discussions like this, but also just going to experiments and working together and having these opportunities to uh, collaborate and share. Um, so, you know, I think it's just the, having the motivation and the willing to 
do that collaboration is going to be probably the biggest motivator for this connection. I was going to, actually I was going to ask, yeah. uh, ask Chris, so, I mean, you have a really good relationship with SpaceX, you know, mm -hmm. that's an example of the collaboration with, with, with industry, so are there any secrets to developing <laughs> that with, uh, we'll say PG&E or, you know, someone who wants to, who we want to be part of this? Right. <clears throat> I think, you know, in part we benefited from the fact that the company we started working with first had several people in high locations in the company that were, didn't want to mess up radio astronomy. <laughs> so, I mean, you had the sort of built-in base. But I, I think uh, passive users, right, uh, have a real advantage. I mean, if you think of Earth monitoring systems, you have, you know, you can talk about things like being able to predict hurricane paths. You know, there are some in, important things that, that affect all of us, right? And so I think you can make an appeal to the commons, right, that these are important things for all of us and let's not mess those things up. I think for you know weather prediction, climate uh, monitoring, et cetera, that's a, a great argument. And you know sometimes I feel like radio astronomy might be able to ride on the coattails of those sorts of protections because, although personally I think the astronomical arguments are strong ones, you know that that might be a more of a stretch to say we you know we we really want to be able to keep doing this thing to advance human knowledge, human understanding, the origin of the universe, you know. Radio astronomers love to bring up the image of the uh, Event Horizon Telescope of, you know, the, the black hole Event Horizon. And, you know, we, we all have our favorite images that we can bring up. And, you know, you can show that those images wouldn't be possible, right, in an environment that changed a lot. So I, I think uh, appealing to our common humanity is maybe a good thing. But that's the disadvantage of radio astronomy is that, you know, we don't have money. <laughs> to throw at these problems often, right? I mean, the, the money that we're throwing at problems, we're throwing at, at the observational work that we want to do, not guaranteeing access, access mm -hmm. to spectrum. Very good. Do you want to say anything? Uh, I feel kind of like a bull in a china shop here. Um, <laughs> I, <clears throat> I'm, I'm, a, I'm an electronic warfare officer, so I'm the one that's interfering with all y'all, and I, I apologize for that right up front. But, but the key, and, and everybody that came up mentioned it, is, is the, the word cooperation. And, and that, that teamwork, um, obviously, I think I foot stomped paths enough, so if you're not a member of National Spectrum Consortium. Uh, but essentially, you know, working together towards these problems that, that we all have, I, I was very encouraged by seeing that, you know, multiple, actually quite a few of us are, are, are all working sprints, if you will, right now for, you know, 16, 18, 12 months, whatever it is. Um, and, and if you look at the natural spectrum strategy, there are multiple efforts working, you know, basically right, running right, right alongside of all those efforts. So us being able to collaborate, us being able to cooperate um, as we find solutions to these hard problems that, that we all have, I think is, is key. So sorry. To, that's great. No, the NSC is a great vehicle, so very good. Okay, let's move to what is marked question number one here. Uh, so field trial one involves demonstrating dynamic spectrum sharing between a radio astronomy facility and a terrestrial system. What does success look like, and how does a successful trial move the needle on spectrum sharing? Um, Chris, do you want to take this? Sure. I guess, I guess I'd also say you've done a lot of coordination with terrestrial systems, and so sure, what yeah. could we do in this field trial that would move beyond that? Right. For those of you who don't know, the National Radio Astronomy Observatory is responsible for the National Radio Quiet Zone, and actually, in the past year, the Puerto Rico Coordination Zone. So uh, we have a young guy, Sheldon Wasik, who's in charge of all of our coordination efforts. So we have a unique uh, ability. We, we know where every transmitter is within the quiet zone because they are required as fixed transmitters to coordinate with us. So, I, I mean, when I think of this problem, you know, what does success look like? You know, one of the things that we all realized this week is that new portions of the spectrum are going to open up for different uses than they've had, right? And so, I think for a long time, in the same way that radio astronomy benefited from being in remote locations, we benefited from the fact that a lot of the people licensed to use parts of the spectrum weren't using them that much, right? And so, as a result, radio astronomy went from, when I was a graduate student, the VLA had a maximum bandwidth of 25 megahertz, right? And so we were in small portions of the spectrum. Well, now, as you may know, radio telescopes have bandwidths of four, eight gigahertz or more. And so we're, we're encompassing much larger portions of the spectrum. Portions of the spectrum that we all know, you know, we don't know, right? We're, th we're there and we're getting more bandwidth and we cut out RFI and we can use the portion of the data that's useful. 
But so to me, a successful experiment and, and a, a su what success might look like is as these new portions of the spectrum open up and are more fully utilized, you know, in active systems, that the radio astronomy observing situation doesn't get worse, right? That would be sort of, and, and how could that happen? Well, it could happen in a situation where, like with the ODS system, right, radio telescopes are informing not only satellite networks, but also nearby cell towers what they're doing. And if those towers can have the flexibility to move to a different band for the period of that observation, then it's not necessarily, you know, downtime for the local cell network, and it allows the radio observatory to at least not be worse than it was, or maybe even better, right? I mean, that's my uh, optimistic goal, right, is that these sorts of interactive active systems will actually allow things to potentially improve for radio astronomy, not all the time, but while we're observing. And I think that would be a measure of success. That's very good. I think I'd like to hear from the ELs if you uh, have comments on this one. So, you know, I mean, one of the things that we're gonna try and do is actually we'll do two metrics. One is safety and the other is effectiveness. So safety really is to, to reduce harmful interference. Microphone. Whoops. Yeah, so, one, so the, the two metrics that we're gonna try and push, which I think would be indicative of success, would be safety and effectiveness. And what does that mean really for radio astronomy? So safety in this case uh, would be reducing harmful interference. Can we observe in bands that weren't accessible before through some coordinated mechanisms as these coordination mechanisms are improving through CBRS and AFC mechanisms? Can we do better? Can we make more bands available in radio astronomy? I mean, over these last two years, uh, talking with the radio astronomers, I realized that they don't, they don't observe only in the bands they've allocated. They observe in all bands. So can we make these bands accessible to them effectively uh, uh, to do that? So that would, be, that would be sort of, you know, can we reduce the RFI uh, so that they can do that and throw less data out? So success would be they're throwing less data out today than they were doing yesterday. Maybe that's a measure. Uh, um, uh, and, and from what I understand is, if you allow them to have less RFI, then the amount of observation time reduces too. So now you increase capacity of your telescope. So fundamentally, you are enabling more science. So I think there are some measures if we can uh, do this uh, right, um, we, could, we could really make an impact. But I, I think the question is going to be how are we going to convince people to do this, especially for radio astronomy, as Chris pointed out, there's no money you can throw at them. <laughs> but we can talk about that in a bit. I mean, I guess, uh, you know, I'll add, you know, back to my comment about, I guess, portability or, you know, verifying that stuff scales and, and moves around. You know, again, if, if we start with Hat Creek and the, these identified smart meters and the ISM band, um, you know, if we're successful there with the discernment algorithms and, and detection algorithms, then, you know, take it to Chris's location and, you know, while they might not have the same smart meters, uh, you know, again, the, the capability might translate to, you know, the, the six gigahertz Wi-Fi or the, you know, the, the different Wi-Fi systems or the other internet things, you know, just stuff that's happening. There's just a variety. And again, there's a variety of smart meters out there. They don't just be in the 900 by RCM. So I think it's the, you know, one measure of success is, you know, successfully showing that you can discern the interference at this location and then taking it to another location. I'll just highlight the, um, the definition that I gave earlier just a little bit, is the adaptive coexistence uh, comment that I, that I talked about. And um, you know, the comment was made earlier about, you know, you don't use the spectrum all the time. And, and I, I understand that. I, I don't even try, I try not to say I use the spectrum. I say I operate in the spectrum. And, and really that assured spectrum access is, is what we're really truly, DOD is really truly needing. Um, that 24 seven access when we need it. If we're launching aircraft, if we're launching or, or trying to defend this nation from something, we need access to spectrum when we need it. Um, but certainly open to ways that we can securely coexist and, and have that adaptive coexistence with, with all entities. So I'm hearing communication and coordination, which is a perfect segue to the next question, which is federal agencies are willing to share spectrum, comma, if doing so does not impact their missions. So maybe I'll turn this back to Colonel Truba right away, but how can we design field trials two through N to lower the barriers to enable future spectrum sharing? So um, 
you know, I'll, I'll touch my notes a little bit, but but ultimately, um, you know, we we have examples of, of how we've done this, how we've shared, DOD has shared spectrum before, uh, CBRS, AMBIT, um, AWS3, um, we, we continue to improve on each of these iterations and, and we look forward to that as we move forward. But um, you know, we have this longstanding commitment. We, we want this nation to get stronger. We want this nation to economically and national security wise um, be, be secure into the future. And so um, we, we look forward to this sprint as we move forward. You know, it's gonna be, a, it's gonna be a, 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 some work um, but we look forward to looking at those, and, and I know we've talked about some lower TRL technologies, and, and you know, we look forward to the, the high TRL technologies, at least right off the bat, with the eye of this is what's coming next. And, and we wanna make sure that as we build this framework that we're looking at those opportunities as well so that we can expand those sharing opportunities moving forward. So, Chris, I said something pretty provocative, right? I mean, what do you think about the slippery slope of you know, letting someone else use your bands when you're not observing them. <laughs> yeah. but I'm not speaking for all of radio astronomy here. I mean, I, I think things are, are changing rapidly enough that, you know, all discussions should happen. Uh, although, I will say this, if you ever want to um, appreciate how, you know, exclusive uh, use of the part of the spectrum that contains the H1 line has protected the radio spectrum, look at any spectrum from, you know, 1300 to 1500 megahertz, and that little narrow band right around the H1 line is clean almost all the time. Um, this is a, you know, for those of you who don't know, the H1 line is this fundamental um, tool for understanding both the structure of our galaxy, the structure of the universe, uh, and, and the, yeah, the, the danger there, I, I don't think necessarily everything would require <laughs> the same level of protection as, as that mm -hmm. portion of the spectrum, but I think that would meet uh, with with some resistance. Not, not all radio bands, but that one in particular has been so fundamental to our understanding that I could see uh, resistance to that. I mean, if, if in demonstration projects it be became very clear that other users could clear out of the spectrum entirely, and this was proven over time, mm -hmm. then, you know, I, I think for ground-based radio astronomy to observe, radio astronomy will have to change um, and, you know, but, but the protections of particular lines are international. Those aren't national um, protections, right? Those are ITU protections. And so, you know, the, the, even if the U.S. goes forward in a certain direction, th that won't mean things will change globally. And then the problem there is so many of our issues in RFI now are global because they're based in satellite technology. Yep. Yells, do you have any thoughts on this question? Yeah, well, yeah, so maybe if I, you know, I'll skip over two, three and go to, you know, field trial 20 or something, you know, there's there's other research that we've started to see with, you know, both, you know, spectrum markets and like the different economic type of things, but also even, I mean, we heard a lot about AIML, so let's get some cognitive radios in here that are going to automatically spectrum share, like, you know, how do we, again, certify there or get sign off from NTIA, FCC, or whoever, and so, you know, we should be thinking about like what would the field trial be that that can show that yeah these markets work you know people clear out like Chris says you got this purely cognitive decision maker that's jumping around frequency um, you know again like I said field trial 20 but maybe you should think a little bit as we do our research think about how you're going to verify that in the field maybe that's the appeal yeah I, I almost say like there are different incentives for different uh, stakeholders in this whole area you know, I think the, the uh, you have the federal agencies and fundamentally, uh, you know, internationally, if you really look at passive astronomy, you have uh, satellites of all different types in space. And so what are the incentives for them to be able to, uh, to participate and protect spectrum or share spectrum effectively because they are giving out a signal by le just letting you know they're there and willing to share. Uh, and so that's, that's one type of stakeholder. The other stakeholder is, is an active uh, transmitter, which I think is sort of the easiest one because you could you could always incentivize them with some resources, money, uh, an easy resource. Uh, and then the other stakeholder is people who are just willing to give up things for the good, for, for the larger good. I mean, we've seen examples of that happening with, the, with SpaceX here. 
um, where they're not really, you know, they're not, they're just doing it for, for, for the larger good. So I think we need to come up with a larger framework to incentivize correctly in order to make sharing happen for, you know, field trial N. And, and what that framework looks like, I think there is a bunch of research going on in, in economics and social sciences that will help drive some of that. All right, very good. So we've got five minutes till the coffee break. We have one more question. It's a three-parter, so if you can each hit one part of it maybe quickly, then we could take a question from the audience if we have time. So <coughs> question, the three-part question is, what are the metrics or standards for a successful field trial? Are they purely technical? I don't think so. Uh, what outcomes or results would help translate technical achievement into actionable policy? Yeah, so I'll, I'll take a shot at that. I mean, I'll expand what I sort of said earlier. I feel, I feel that technical solutions are always easier. I think we can get to technical solutions, we can get to metrics, and we can help convince our technical colleagues, but then translating that into policies and regulations is gonna be a big, a bigger jump, right? Be and, and you know, you ultimately need to get uh, get that enacted. So I think it's going to be we can use the technical approach to build trust and convince uh, convince convince people uh, about spectrum sharing and how effective it is. But then translating it into policy will require a set of incentives, uh, and those incentives will change for every stakeholder. And and um, and you know, just as I mentioned, these stakeholders are very different and we'll have to sort of think very holistically how all of this comes together within an NRDZ toolkit to really make all of this work. I'll, ju I'll just add repeatability. Um, you know, just imagine in the future you turn on your RDZ, you'll go through the systems checks, maybe there's a few stock unit tests, spectrum sharing e examples, and like, if it always works every time, it's repeatable, now you're starting to build confidence and you know, there's, you're reducing that uncertainty, you're reducing the variability, so. To me, it seems like repeatability. Yeah, I'll just add that, you know, what, what radio astronomy can do is it can sort of share information about their operational, their current operational status. And, you know, cellular and satellite companies have some amount of flexibility, right? And so, but in order to, for that flexibility to be used, uh, to be useful, they need to know what a, a telescope is doing, right? So if a telescope is operating out of band, they shouldn't, have to do anything special, right? I mean, that's not going to impact the observations. And so that sort of, you know, we're, we're starting the ODS system. Uh, the earliest test was sort of one-way sharing. Eventually, we'd like to get to two-way sharing where we, uh, you know, maybe even have uh, real-time access to satellite positions, right? So that we could actually, you know, along the lines, uh, Kevin, of what your, your group is working on, you're working with publicly available data. What if that could become a sort of real-time you know, sharing system in some sort of an encrypted site so that telescopes could really know what the sky looks like at all times and that could sort of be a real-time system that could be used in telescope scheduling, right? So as we look forward to NGVLA, the next generation very large array, some of these scheduling algorithms will probably, you know, want to take into account not only uh, weather and wind load but also satellite positions and that would be great if that could be part of the real-time operations. I will probably <laughs> burn on time, but um, if you look at the Ember, uh, you know conditions in the Ember study and, and the, the Indian Ember study, most of those are actually the policy conditions. Mm -hmm. Like if you if you really dive deep into it, now there are um, you know as I mentioned before, cybersecurity, operational security, those could be you know biased towards a, a policy decision um, depending on where you're at. The AI ML, okay, we we've talked about that plenty of times, but those could also help us with the operational security and the cybersecurity. Um, but, but ultimately, you know, we, we, we understand with this, again, my 12 to 18 month sprint um, moving forward that, you know, there are gonna be several policy considerations that we're going to have to look at this technology and say, okay, is this helping us? Are we gonna, and then we look forward to working with NTIA and, and others in the interagency and industry to, and academia to discern, you know, what, what are the best metrics? How do we align those metrics with, you know, what policies we would like to see um, enable those metrics, if you will, in the future and, and moving forward, so. Yes. Very good, thank you. And it is four o'clock, but we started five minutes late, so I'm going to say let's take one or two questions from the audience. All right. Yeah, <coughs> I, uh, I think uh, it's more for the NSF that's bad. I mean, you mentioned 
on the uh, personal security and uh, cyber security. Now the question is, uh, what do you do about it, right? I mean, I think, are you thinking about specific red teaming or specific testing focus to actually understand what are those security problems in those spectrum sharing techniques, for example? What are your thoughts? So I, I would say, I'd say it's a little too early uh, for, for, for that decision making. I mean, there are obviously within DOD, there are several sensitivities to obviously securing our capabilities and what we're doing and how, how we're operating and how often we're operating in certain areas. And, and so that is of consideration as we're starting this process. But as far as how to get at those, um, I know the Ember study talked about them briefly, and, and I encourage you to kind of look at how that framed it. But um, that's one of the areas where we're really, we really are trying to focus on, both on the policy side and the technology side, of what solutions are out there that how, how help us, as, as Ms. Bon, uh, Bonner. Austin Bonner, right? Bonner. Mrs. Bonner said, you know, the obfuscation component of that for us is, is critically important. We also, in, in DOD, to be honest, we, we, have, we have to get comfortable being a little uncomfortable without sacrificing our mission, right? And so we've gotta, gotta be cognizant of that as well. Cool, thank you. All right, one more? No? Is, uh, sorry, Spectrum of SpaceX is really great. But we learned about basically new companies, mega constellations coming in, perhaps hundreds of thousands of satellites will be there. Not, perhaps half of them will not be US companies that perhaps you might not be coordinating. So if you think that kind of a scenario, do you think still just kind of opening or closing the satellites while they're passing over you is it, is a good solution, or what are your thoughts for the future, uh, future when we have that many satellites over your telescopes? Yeah. No, it's an excellent question, and you know certainly the pilot we've been doing is uh, is workable for a smaller number of satellites. I think it remains to be seen how many satellite networks will successfully be launched and be in operations 10 years from now? You know, we don't know, but you're absolutely right. I think, um, and we've already seen this issue uh, in some of our early test data, in the test data that, that you know, where you saw the boresight avoidance in, in, engaged and we see the RFI from SpaceX is, is quenched. We see RFI from other players, right? So in that same band, right, from 10.7 to 12.7 gigahertz, we see other RFI. So, you know, uh, one thing, you know, that, that I worry about is, and SpaceX, you know, they, they haven't really said this, but, you know, they could look at that result and say, well, look, we're doing this, but you still have all this other RFI. What does it really even matter, right? And so I, I think you're absolutely right. I, I think, you know, the next five to 10 years will we'll be telling in terms of how many satellites are actually launched, how many networks are operational. But, you know, one, one hope I have is that and one reason we're working so hard to get this system working is that, you know, if we can show that a system like this works, that the FCC could say for other satellite constellations to operate in the U.S., they have to follow a certain set of rules that have been proven to work. And I think that's our best uh, strategy going forward. All right. In the interest of letting us all go recaffeinate, I will close the session and thank the panelists one more time. Yeah.